Oh, good evening, everybody. Can, does this work? Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, wow, academics dangerous, aren't they? Um, okay, so I, I put, actually, I should say, as a full disclaimer, um, my PhD is in sociology, so psychology has nothing to do with me. I'm not guilty of any of those kind of um, heinous atrocities that we've just seen on screen. Um, okay, um, well, I, I suppose the first thing to do is, um, the talk this evening is probably going to have two parts, I suppose. The, the first part, um, my responsibility is maybe to just introduce um, a little bit of background behind um, the Stanford Prison Experiment or the Zimbardo Experiment, um, talk a little bit about some of the other experiments, and also um, try and get into why these type of experiments uh, were put in place and really why they're not there um, anymore. Um, and then uh, Vivian is going to come up and talk about really the implications of this type of research, especially when we talk about things like um, imprisonment, mass incarceration um, in the United States uh, right now at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, one, well, one of the reasons why we don't have these type of experiments anymore is because of, well, what happened to the subjects and what happened to the experiment, as you saw, kind of dramatized on screen. Um, if you work in a university now and you want to do some research, or if you're a student in a university, you have to submit your research to the IRB, the Institutional Review Board. Um, and that really is in place now uh, to stop potentially things like this. Um, people who are experts in terms of research who will look at your um, research protocols to make sure that um, no harm can come to the uh, subjects that you study. Um, in terms of a background to this experiment, I think the first thing to maybe mention is the idea that of what social psychology is, which is what uh, Philip Zimbardo was doing and what, is, what he was interested in. Um, really, in social psychology, the emphasis is on how the social environment can affect the psychology of the well-being uh, or well-being of the individual. In other words, how the social environment can affect behavior or attitude. Um, and to put it simply, it's sometimes described as studying the power of situations or particular situations. Um, now, in, contact, in context to this experiment, the interest, I think, of Zimbardo is understanding the concept of evil. In other words, how can a social environment potentially build in someone the desire to deliberately, um, and I'm going to use um, some of Zimbardo's own words, deliberately harm, um, commit cruelty, or dehumanizing, or dehumanize another human being. So the idea is Zimbardo is attempting to understand, well, how does that social environment lead to someone wanting or willfully participating or uh, committing these type of acts? Um, with that, hopefully this works, he created the Zimbardo prison experiment. And what you have there, I thought uh, the John Wayne character would be uh, of most interest. So the prison guard there um, with the sunglasses on, that was the John Wayne character, the, the name that the prisoners gave that individual. Um, and as, as it's kind of dramatized in the film, that's exactly what happened. It was set up so that the prisoners would um, be arrested. Um, they would have police coming to their homes and they would be taken away in a squad car and then um, made to strip and be deloused. And the idea of that was, I suppose, to ensure that they enter into this social environment, that those kind of powers and the idea of, well, this is just an experiment, this is just a simu simulation, is um, taken away from them. So they're kind of disorientated to that new environment to get, I suppose, as close to how a prison can potentially f affect the psychology of an individual. Now, I, sh I probably should mention at this point that prisons, as we understand them today, are relatively new. Um, as we understand them today, I think it's fair to say, may, may, maybe Vivian, uh, hopefully Vivian will agree, um, prisons are really, as we understand them, an American concept. Um, so. I suppose America is famous for inventing jazz and the banjo and um, detective fiction 
and, and modern prisons. Um, you know, the first modern prison as we understand it today uh, was the Walnut St uh, Street Prison in um, Philadelphia. Um, rapidly followed by Eastern State Penitentiary in 1829. But um, this, even though it's relatively new, there was an awful lot of criticism for these prisons right at the very beginning of their development. Possibly, I, I, I wanted to share some, but I, I kind of, with time constraints, I limited it to one, which is um, from Charles Dickens. Uh, Charles Dickens, uh, if you know anything about him, um, he visited America, he had a lot of uh, um, American friends, was very intrigued by the country. Um, and in 1842, he published um, American, uh, American Notes for General Circulation, and he talks about Eastern State Penitentiary, which he visited. Uh, this is just a little brief snippet, snippet of it, which I think we can marry to Zimbardo's experiment. Um, I'll just read it out. I believe that very few men are capable of estimating the immense amount of torture and agony which this dreadful punishment, prolonged for years, inflicts upon the sufferers. And in guessing at it myself, and in reasoning from what I have written upon their faces, and what to my certain knowledge they feel within, I am only the more convinced that there is a depth of terrible endurance in which none but the sufferers themselves can fathom, and which no man has a right to inflict on his fellow creature. Um, Dickens, to use modern, I suppose, terminology, Dickens was very much um, interested and, and appalled by the uh, psychology or the psychological effect that such a punishment would have on the individuals. Um, more so because there are no obvious physical damage to uh, prisoners. You can't look at you can look at torture and you can see the effect of torture. The physical scars will be on the body. But Dickens was um, appalled by the idea that you don't see these scars. Um, and as he goes on to the state, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. And because its ghastly signs and tokens are not so palpable to the eye and sense of touch as scars upon the flesh, because its wounds are not upon the surface, and it extorts few cries that human ears can hear, therefore the more I denounce it, as a secret punishment which slumbering humanity is not roused to stay. Um, basically, he's arguing we have a potential to be completely apathetic to prisoners and to prisons. We uh, have the potential to be completely ignorant of the effect that these environments can potentially have on the people who are incarcerated in there, and possibly even more so on the people who work within these environments. Now, where these type of experiments came from um, is obviously developing out of um, the endless lung or the final solution. Um, in 1945, well, following, I suppose it's fair to say, April and May of 1945 and the end of the Second World War in Europe, allies became aware of the atrocities perpetrated against Jews um, in concentration camps. And coming out of it was the idea of understanding how such an action can be perpetrated how such evil can be perpetrated. And Zibado has talked about the paradox of evil in the sense that if I was to ask each and every one of you today to mention and to give me an evil act going on in the world right now in 2019, you could all give me one. But if we were, uh, if we were to ask the individuals who you identified perpetrating evil acts, they would turn around and argue that what they were doing is not evil. That's the paradox of evil. You can spot it, you can argue it exists, but those people who perpetrate it never state, oh yeah, I'm out to commit some evil today. Um, instead, what you'll find is the argument, we're doing this for defense. We're doing this because we need to. We need to safeguard ourselves. We have to invade this country because that country represents a potential danger to us. Therefore, we must defend it. So, in, in Hitler's own terms, um, from Mein Kampf, as he argues, anyone who wants to cure this era, which is inwardly sick and rotten, 
must first of all summon up the courage to make clear the causes of this disease. And as we know, um, to Hitler, to put it in a simplistic form, the causes of the disease were Jews. They were infecting the civilization that the Aryan race had created. And through this infection, the society, the civilization, was slowly being eroded, being destroyed, and therefore to cure society, you must terminate the disease. Um, just as one Nazi doctor in his trial in Nuremberg stated, that the Jew is the gangrenous appendix in the body of mankind. To go back to Zimbardo's paradox of evil, from their perspective, they are simply doing a good thing. It's a defense. We're trying to ensure civilization is strong and healthy. We're getting rid of the weakness. We're getting rid of the infection. So coming out of this um, era, academics, sociologists, uh, criminologists, psychologists, other types of social scientists were very interested in, well, how can such an action occur as genocide? Is it easy to just simply say this dispositional argument that, well, Hitler was evil, and therefore um, these atrocities, and I apologize for the graphic nature of these pictures, that these atrocities then were simply committed by evil individuals. It is just a perfect snow, snowstorm or, or, what is snowstorm? What's the term? Perfect storm. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about snow, actually. I, I, I teach in Lebanon Valley College, which is 70 miles away, so when it snows, I'm, I get terrified. So anyway, um, perfect, perfect storm of just a collection of evil individuals. Well, the simple answer is no. How can you have thousands of people that would re be required to perpetrate such an act as genocide, to organize such an act of genocide? Um, how does it work? Um, the argument from the social psychological perspective is it's not dispositional, it's situational. It's back to that original piece. The somehow, the social environment creates this within our own psychology, leading to people who are willing to perpetrate acts like this. So the attempt was can we set up experiments that identify the way in which a perfectly normal, seemingly normal individual will commit an act of violence? Probably the most famous example prior to the Zimbardo experiment, some of you might have heard of, is the Milgram um, obedience experiment. Um, as Milgram says, obedience as a determinant of behavior is of particular relevance to our time. It has been re reliably established that from 1933 to 1945, millions of innocent people were systematically slaughtered on command. Gas chambers were built, death camps were guarded, daily quart quotas of corpses were produced with the same efficiency as the manufacture of appliances. These inhumane policies may have originated in the mind of a single person, but they could only have been carried out on a massive scale if a very large number of people obeyed orders. So Milgram, um, working at Yale University in the early 1960s, started to devise an experiment. Um, and the experiment was, could he get a random group of people off the street and get them to give a potentially lethal electric shock to somebody whom they've just met? Now, Milgram's original argument for this was, in America, very unlikely. Most psychologists argued it would probably be less than one-tenth of one percent of, of people in America who would actually perpetrate these acts. Um, his original argument was then, potentially, it's something to do with Germany, maybe their willingness to obey orders, um, as opposed to Americans who have greater emphasis on individuality. So the idea was, okay, well, let's set up an experiment in um, Yale. We'll advertise, we'll get some people in, and we'll set up the experiment. If you're not familiar with it, I'll just kind of quickly run through it. Basically, you had two people. You had a teacher and a learner. And it was seemingly random um, who was teacher and learner, but really it was a setup. The learner uh, was an actor and the teacher was the person who was being experimented on. The one other person in the room was dressed in a white 
coat to look like a scientist and an authority figure. Um, looked like he was part of Yale University. He wasn't. He was a biology teacher. He was just part of the experiment as well. But the idea was the uh, learner would go into a room, be strapped down to a uh, electric shock plate. Um, he would explain to the teacher as he was being strapped down to the electric shock plate, oh, I have a heart condition. Is this going to be a problem? Um, the um, experimenter, the person in the white coat, would simply say, no, it shouldn't be a problem. Yes, the, exper the shocks uh, can be painful, but it, it, it shouldn't be lethal. And then the teacher was taken into another room where he was introduced to a machine with a series of electric shocks, all the way up to triple X. Very, very dangerous. And the argument was, can you convince this person to keep giving electric shocks every time a person was given a wrong response to a series of questions? Can you keep giving them electric shocks and order this teacher to go all the way to the triple X and actually get them to shock three times? At one point in the experiment, you'll hear the learner shout, I have a heart condition, I'm in pain, um, please stop the experiment. He'd get more agitated, stop the experiment, I can't take this anymore, stop the experiment, my heart's uh, hurting. And then there would be silence, and the person would be instructed to keep giving the electric shocks. And as I say, Milgram's argument was, okay, well, we're really, you know, um, we're going to have a very small percentage of Americans who will do this. Out of the 40 um, respondents in the, this original experiment, 50% of them went all the way up to the triple X and did it three times. Um, this shocked Milgram. He did a series of other types of experiments. Um, you know, would they be willingly hold down the learner's hand onto an electric shock plate as well as give electric shocks? Would they, if they were just part of a group, would they obey more? So therefore, they wouldn't have certain levels of responsibility. So Milgram starts to theorize, well, really then, what we're talking about here is we live in a society that makes us obey. We look for authority figures. He called it the agentic state. And it's basically the argument that whenever you go into a new environment, you look for a person of authority. And you will look for them to explain certain things. Yeah, I, I do it here. One of, the, one of the great things I enjoy here is working as, as the assistant manager. And oftentimes, people kind of wonder out there, if you've, you've come to this theater, you'll know. You'll, you'll people wander out and go, where are the bathrooms? And I'll just be standing there in my authoritative way, and someone will come immediately up to me. Do you know where the bathrooms are? And presumably, I could point them in any direction. And they will just follow that. Um, I don't, because I'm, I'm, I'm really nice. I'm a sociologist, not a psychologist. So, um, so as I say, um, but there is the desire to listen to authority. And what uh, Milgram says is, well, the reality of it is we are conditioned to do that. To use a psycholo psychological term or a sociology term, we are socialized to do that. From the very early age, we are socialized to obey our parents, authority figures. Listen to your parents. If you don't, you'll get punished. If you do, you get rewarded. If you don't eat your sausages, you're going into the hole. If you eat your sausages, you can go to bed. Right? After that, what happens to us? We go to school where we're introduced to teachers, authority figures, who will tell us what to do. If you do well, I'll go back to when I was in, in Britain, big tick for you, gold star. Well done, Andrew. If you don't do well, i.e. you don't listen to the teacher, then punishment for you. I was, I was old enough um, to remember corporal punishment. Caning was still part of, of school. Um, then you go on to work. Your boss. You want to listen and do well for your boss. Why? Well, if you do well, you'll get rewarded. What does that mean? Promotion. If you don't do well, you could get fired. So Milgram's argument is we have created a society or a social environment in which this agentic state is completely common and natural. You put somebody into a social environment with an obvious authority figure, this biology teacher with his white coat, then the potential is 
you listen to the authority figure because you don't want to get punished. As Milgram says, one of the things he found, and again, thinking about the Zimbardo experiment, many subjects harshly devalue the victim as a consequence of acting against him. Such comments as, he was so stupid and stubborn, he deserved to get shocked, were common. Once having acted against the victim, these subjects found it necessary to view him as an unworthy individual whose punishment was made inevitable by his own deficiencies of intellect and character. To go back to that concept of the gangrenous appendix to, or that concept of um, infection or disease. Sorry, I'm just going to pause there because I've realized I put the wrong paper away. I'm going to do this without you noticing because I'm going to still be an authority figure. Okay. Um, so the idea is then, okay, how many... When it comes to Zimbardo then, the idea is to, to take this a step further. To actually not just um, have somebody go in and commit um, shocks for however long that duration is, but to set up a two-week experiment to create a total environment, um, a total institution, if you, if you prefer. The idea of a total institution is that you have complete control of all the rules of that social environment. You can dictate when people go to bed. You can dictate how long they sleep for, when they eat, what they wear, what they do. Split it up randomly into two groups of guards and prisoners. Give the guards symbols of authority. Give them the sunglasses. Give them a uniform. Give them nightsticks. Um, and to emphasize, you know, as Zimbardo said, the idea is um, that the guards weren't there to physically abuse anybody. The idea was that they could create punishments, and they were encouraged to be creative in their punishments, but they could not physically uh, hurt someone or be cruel to those individuals. Just an explanation on, on the guards as well, because as I say, in the film, it didn't put a lot of emphasis, emphasis on this, but um, this is from um, Zimbardo's own work um, from 1998. The guards had been carefully chosen on the basis of their normal Average scores on a variety of personality measures. Quickly internalized their randomly assigned role. Many of these seemingly gentle and caring young men, some of whom had described themselves as pacifists or Vietnam war doves, soon began mistreating their peers and were indifferent to the obvious suffering that their actions produced. So what Zimbardo started to theorize, um, to relate it back to um, maybe um, Nazi Germany, but also in relation to prisons and Dickens's argument from 1842, is the idea is that really there is no concept of good and evil as we objectively understand it, because they are mere constructions, they're artificial. Um, one society will have a concept of morality, that might be opposed to another society's concept of morality. We might label another society as evil because we don't believe in their concepts of morality, but from their perspective, we might be evil. So his argument is, and if you go back, to relate it back to the concept of the concentration camp, if you can create a total institution that has its own concept of morality, then the guards, will be praised and rewarded for keeping order. The prisoners will be praised and rewarded for being model prisoners. The highest level of authority, Zimbardo, as the superintendent of the institution, will give out that praise. He will condone that punishment. So now we have a social environment with a different type of morality. And we start to see guards moving towards that form of morality. John Wayne is great because he ensures that obedience and authority is followed. The prisoners who act out, who try to act like individuals, are a problem. 
that needs to be cured, that needs to be handled or dealt with. As Zimbardo says, several of them, the prison, prison guards, several of them devised sadistically inventive ways to harass and degrade the prisoners. And none of the less actively cruel mock guards ever intervened or complained about the abuses they witnessed. Our planned two-week experiment had to be aborted after only six days because the experiment dramatically and painfully transformed most of the participants in many ways we did not anticipate prepare for or predict. And it is kind of explained in, in, in the movie basically what happened. It's, the events really are kind of manipulated in the movie, but basically what happened was um, a colleague who had not been part of the early stages of the uh, experiment came to visit and um, it was actually around the time of the first parent visit. And what had happened in that first parent visit was Zimbardo explained to his guards that he did not want the prisoners to complain to their parents about their treatment. So he wanted them, all the prisoners, to state to their parents or to their loved ones that they were having a good time and that they, they were enjoying their experiences. Um, the prison guards communicated that, told the prisoners that they had to obey. If they did not obey, they would be punished. Um, the parents came, and the prisoners, none of them reported any abuse, stated that they were having a good time. Most of them verbatim to what they'd been told. And Zimbardo, after the um, prisoners had been taken back to the cells, turned to the colleague and explained, this is great. We've got them working exactly how we want them to be. This, this, is, this is great. And then the colleague explained to Zimbardo, you do realize that you're a psychologist, right? That you're not a warden. This is not your prison. This is a basement. Um, and it's at that point that Zimbardo decided to terminate the experiment because he realized that his objectivity had been lost. He'd become immersed in the role in himself. Now, just to kind of finish up and, um, and move to, to Vivian, um, what does this mean in regard to, um, I suppose, what can we can take away from this experiment besides the hyperbole and the, the worries of about ab abuse in, in terms of, um, you know, Stanford students? Zimbardo um, really turned his work into the idea of, well, look at evil environments. Look at prisons where you have this clear demarcation between people in authority and people who lose authority. Look at how this kind of stuff can occur. Um, interestingly enough, and as I say, we want to talk about prisons, but interestingly, I'll just finish with this point. Um, when it came to um, the aftermath of the beginning of the war in Iraq in 2003-2004, um, I'm sure you remember a number of abuses uh, perpetrated by American soldiers, um, two prisoners started to come out, uh, particularly in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Um, this was broken in April 2004 by CBS, but also uh, events in uh, Guantanamo Detention Center. Um, so some of the reports were, uh, maybe you can think of um, you know, this film, prolonged isolation, sleep deprivation. Um, it was created to be a frequent flyer program where basically prisoners were woken up and moved from cell to cell so that didn't have strong, uh, long hours of sleep. Short shackling, which was uh, shown in the film. The idea is uh, to tie someone's arms and legs up in a, in a very uncomfortable manner and leave them there. Nudity, extreme use of heat and cold, use of loud noise, so that people could not get rest or could not um, uh, relax, and also use of phobias on, on prisoners. When this was brought out, uh, a number of uh, investigations took place into these abuses. Uh, probably um, one of the most famous, the Schlesinger Report, um, harks back and directly um, cites the Zimbardo experiment, stating this, and this is the, the slide I'll finish with. The potential for abusive treatment of de detainees during the global war on terrorism was entirely predictable based on a fundamental understanding of the principle of social psychology. 
Findings from the field of social psychology suggest that the conditions of war and the dynamic of detainee operations carry inherent risks for human mistreatment and therefore must be approached with great caution and careful planning and training. So on that note, um, I'm going to invite Vivian up on the stage to talk a little bit about uh, prisons. Thank you, Andrew. Let's see. There, there I am. Um, thank you. I actually had Abu Grab or Grabe uh, on my notes as well. But so I, I see my, oh, because I'm short. Yeah, OK. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I feel important, authoritative. Um, uh, I feel grateful uh, to be joining my colleague. We are buddies uh, going way, way back. Um, well, not that back. We're not that old, right? Um, so I see my um, purpose here to kind of contextualize uh, the film into what is going on today um, in America. And so uh, will you what you can tell from this particular graph is that we are, I call it, the number one incarcerator um, in the world. We um, basically incarcerate approximately 2.2 million people um, in prison right now. And it's not a, it's not a real word, incarcerator, uh, but nevertheless, we have that, um, uh, we have that around the world. We have that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Distinction, thank you. So, why has this happened? What, how can we explain um, this growth in, in incarceration? Um, well, several things, and most of the growth in incarceration, I'm gonna actually go back uh, a minute here, is not because of growth in crime. Um, it actually is due to policies and laws that have uh, been implemented since the 1970s and 1980s when we have, you know, the tough on crime, uh, war on drugs, you know, just say no um, uh, type of era. And so we implemented several uh, several long-term uh, mandatory minimum laws, uh, truth and sentencing laws, three strikes laws that actually made um, our, that our, which is why we increase our population. Now, uh, one of the main reasons, again, why uh, this happened was because of the war on drugs. Um, and so during this time, uh, we saw uh, a lot of people being uh, brought in uh, for crack versus, you know, cocaine. Uh, we had a disparity in terms of uh, if you went in or if you was caught with crack cocaine, you were going in for longer period of times than if you were going in uh, or were caught with uh, powder cocaine. Now, again, the idea of incarceration or the idea that we need to put people in prison for long periods of time was because we should incapacitate people, right? And we say, well, um, prison is used um, as, a form of, uh, as a form of punishment uh, because we believe that people are inherently um, making these decisions to commit a crime. Um, and we call it rational choice in criminology, um, and we also call this part of a Terrence theory. If you see your friend doing something wrong, then and he or she goes to prison or you know gets you know some detention, then you're not going to do it, right? And so that's the idea behind that. And so that also increased um, the ability for politicians to say, be tough on crime, law and order, and for all of you to then go to the polls and say, I'm going to vote for that tough on crime. Po, you know, politician, because if you're soft on crime, you must think that criminals are okay, right? So, um, one of the things that we know is that incarceration um, does not, is not a uh, equal opportunity uh, type of employer, in a sense. I'm making a joke here, uh, but really a sad statistic is that uh, the likelihood of incarceration changes based on uh, your race and also your gender. And so we see that black and brown people are usually incarcerated at higher rates and have a, a higher likelihood uh, of imprisonment. And sometimes my students will say, well, that's just because black and brown people commit more crimes. I'm like, well, no, not necessarily. Um, we have issues of implicit bias, sentencing policies um, that actually increase the likelihood of people uh, of, color, of color going into prison at much higher rates. 
So what do we know about the inside um, of a prison? So from a person that has actually been into uh, prisons, uh, have done research uh, with people in prison, it really infuriates me to to watch this particular uh, film. Um, and I show it to my, I don't show this particular film, but snippets of the Stanford experiment to my students. Um, and they think is not real. Like I have to tell them and explain them that no, this really uh, did happen. Um, and so I wanted to kind of contextualize what, how does this all play out right now? And so one of the things that we know is that uh, we treat people in prisons um, uh, in inhumane manners, right? I mean, they do have rights, uh, but there are policies uh, that continue to be in place that are inhumane. And one of those things that have come out over and over again, as you saw the whole, uh, was basically solitary confinement. And it's known as, you know, uh, administrative segregation, um, and it goes by many names depending on the state. And so what we know is that uh, solitary confinement oftentimes uh, does have um, really uh, it worsened the effects uh, of people that are in prison. And so what does it do? Um, so studies have shown that uh, it actually gives people psychotic, as you saw, psychotic episodes. Uh, people could become acutely suicidal, hallucinations, paranoia. It diminishes their impulse control. Uh, and they also have, um, they have a hypersensitivity uh, to external stimuli. So when they come out, like just, you know, thinking that, you know, you're seeing something on the wall or that you're scratching often. So this hyper uh, stimuli or hypersensitivity actually comes out from being uh, in solitary confinement. If you want to kind of know what solitary confinement feels like, um, there is a really uh, nice uh, kind of simulation uh, uh, on the Guardian and you can put on uh, these like 3D glasses that you can sort of, I don't know what they're called, like you can put your phone on there. See this, I'm showing my age here. But like you put your phone and like it's a virtual reality, that's what they're called. Uh, and so you can you can kind of simulate what that could feel like. Um, and, and this is part of that particular simulation. So um, one of the things I wanted to speak uh, about uh, in terms of um, solitary confinement, one, we know that under President Obama and actually under the current president, we're trying to make strides to decrease the population of uh, prisoners. Uh, we understand that it is it is wrong and it actually doesn't increase public safety, which is which was in 1970s and 80s and 90s, that if we put more people in prison, more people will learn and then we will have less crime and so we will be a happy type of society. So I bring up Khalif Browder, because Khalif Browder has become actually the poster board for um, uh, the abolishment of solitary confinement in prison. And so Khalif Browder was a young man, about 15, 16 years old uh, in New York, who uh, was picked up by police one night after coming back from a party for apparently stealing a backpack. Um, is anybody familiar with the Khalif Browder story a little bit? Okay. Um, and so he was basically put into um, into the jail, um, and because he was a juvenile at Rikers Island, he was put in solitary confinement. He actually spent over two and a half years uh, in solitary confinement, and so you can imagine sort of the effects of that once he was released. The, the interesting part of it, which uh, it's sad, is that he sat in jail because he couldn't afford his bail, and that was about $500, right? Um, and so he came out of prison, uh, people began to hear his story, and actually there's a really nice, um, there's a really good documentary or docu-series on his story, um, and he unfortunately um, committed suicide in 2015. And so he has become kind of the poster child of like what can happen um, when we implement solitary confinement. Besides him, however, we basically have um, use our prisons uh, as mental health institutions. So when mental health hospitals closed, we actually had a lot of people that were mentally ill be funneled into the criminal justice system because they're seen as deviant, right? If someone is out on the street doing something that you don't think is normal, you call the police, the police picks the person up and they can go in for you know public disobedience or something like that. And so what we also know about prisons and the use of prisons um, is that we are funneling more and more people into um, 
that have mental issues. And so they end up in prison, but they also end up in solitary confinement much more often than anyone else because what might seem to you as you know someone could say someone could spit on the guard and that could be part of the way that they're demonstrating that there's something wrong well they're going to take that the guard is going to take that and said well off to segregation and so they tend to be there much more often for longer periods of times and we have a cycle and the cycle is you're already mentally ill you go into solitary confinement and you are more mentally ill. And so there's this kind of sick cycle that continues. And so what does this all mean at the end of the day? Um, is could we have a state where we perhaps don't use prisons as, mar as much as a form of punishment? Well, what we know is that about two thirds of the population are going to be released into society. And so why not why treat, why, why should we treat prisoners um, in a different way? Why should we treat people that are in prison in, in, uh, in more humane uh, ways? Well, they're going to come out, and they're going to be your neighbors, and they're going to be, at, hopefully, uh, maybe working alongside you, right? And so what I would like people to take away uh, from this is that if we t treat people like animals, we cannot expect them to come out and be something different. That's it. So, so I just want to um, invite anybody to, if they have any questions or anything like that, to ask myself to or, or Vivian, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, I just want to um, maybe just follow up a, a couple of things as well, because Vivian and I worked uh, together for a few years, and one of the things that we did uh, was an Inside Out course. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a, uh, an Inside Out program. Um, basically, uh, an inside out program is where you take um, students, typically undergraduate students who are in a university, and uh, take them to a co correctional facility where they have a class the entire semester um, with um, individuals who are currently incarcerated in that institution. And the idea of it is, beyond just the simple educational thing of, do, of doing a class, is to explain to younger people, many of whom who might be taking criminology uh, because they want to become police officers um, or other types of authority figures, is to explain that um, prisoners are individuals. They are beyond the label as, uh, you know, hacking back to the Zimbardo experiment. Um, maybe the other thing I want to mention um, as well is something that um, concerns me when we talk about mass incarceration, which is the idea of um, losing the right to vote if you are a, a felony prisoner. Um, this is not something that is typical uh, the world over. Most, you know, if you, if you take the country of Germany, for instance, they uh, not only continually allow uh, their prisoners to vote, they actually actively encourage it, arguing that these people should have a voice on how society should change. Um, whereas the United States, um, 48 states and the District of Columbia um, treat felony prisoners as individuals who lose the right to vote, with many states then continuing to ensure that they lose the right to vote once they are paroled, with some states continuing to take the vote uh, away from them even after the duration of parole um, has expired. Um, so again, when we talk about the idea of cruelty and those guards and the desire to ensure obedience, um, it's, a, it's a worrying thing that you can continually take someone's voice uh, away from them. So anyway, with that, uh, anyway, please, uh, if you have any kind of questions, uh, anything you concerns, please feel free to do so.
<laughs> um, I, I don't know. Okay, so, no. Um, but um, it's... Um, okay, I'll, I'll have a go, one go out of it. And then, um, like the one thing that comes to mind for, for me is it's like this. When, when, when I say to you that currently, you know, 2.2 million people incarcerated, another 4.8 million individuals who are on probation and parole, um, or roughly about 3% of the adult population in some form of correctional um, observation, um, if I say to that, it's, all, it's a bunch of statistics, right? It's, it's back to the Stalin thing, right? The death of one is a tragedy, the death of millions is just a statistic. Um, and I think, you know, and to, to maybe go back to the, the Dickens the argument as well, is, is we are typically blind to that. Possibly many of us in this room are not aware that uh, America is the world leader when it comes to incarceration. Um, so with that in mind, I think, and to go back to your CEOs, um, these are just figures. These are just um, numbers. They're not individuals. We don't necessarily, you know, when we, when we look at, at, at Vivian's presentation, there is an individual that we can look at. But otherwise, they are just, they are just figures. They are, just, they are perpetrators, right? They are, they are prisoners. Um, they are something other than us. Um, and that's, I think that's the worrying thing, is the potential that we can be whether we hear a CEO um, lay off a bunch of people, or if we hear politicians going to uh, ordering a bunch of people to war, um, we can look at those politician. We can look at that CEO. But look, what about us? We could do. Do we have to stay, sit here and be apathetic to to that policy, um, or can we actually voice a dissent to it? Um, you know, because at the end of the day, one of the things that I didn't include here, but um, one of the favorite things to talk about is Stanley Kubrick um, motivated to make Dr. Strangelove because he was completely shocked in October of 1962 to see how many Americans were completely apathetic to the Cuban Missile Crisis with the imminent threat of, of nuclear war and potentially the end of civilization, most Americans' response was, from Kubrick's perspective was, well, there's nothing I can do about it. So I think, not a great answer, but I think you know, the worrying thing is, is let us not be apathetic to numbers um, and uh, try and do something about it. Maybe Vivian has a better answer. No, I, just, I was gonna try to um, say that it, I think that when we go into classes, oftentimes we set, you know, thinking about what we do, we set the rules, we set kind of the class, and we set the tone of the class. And so I, I don't know that if it's just Yale or, or Stanford or these Ivy League schools, I think it could be, and as the, as the experiment showed in, in Milgram, that it could really be anyone, right? Um, and also I just, uh, I thought about uh, I was in the military at, right out of high school, uh, and I remember they had they had these three phases in boot camp, right? And the first phase was, and I can't remember, and if anyone's in the military, like kind of this decivilization uh, phase. It was like phase one, and that's where they kind of stripped uh, every, the civilian out of you. And so my drill sergeants were always would say, like, I'm going to kick the civilian out of you. Pacheco at that time, that was my last name. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be me. And then by phase two, I was like, okay, just tell me what to do. Tell me where to go. We were so sleep deprived. I remember, you know, and they would do similar things. And I'm sure that the way that the military, and I don't know if it has continues to do so, but that's the way that they would get you to really do what they wanted you to do, right? Uh, phase two, we got more sleep because that's where we were uh, sh you know, at the shooting range. Uh, but first, you know, phase one, um, they, they, we, we didn't know where we were standing, right? And, um, and I thought I was a pretty, you know, I was an individual, and I was join joining the Army for many different reasons. But so to, to that point, I don't know that if it's just them. Yeah. Sorry, was there another question?
answer for that one? What, why aren't we able to change? Um, Go ahead, you yeah. can take a stab at um, it. Um, I, th I think one of the things is it's, it's a mindset when, when it comes to prisons, which is um, a discussion about um, punishment or rehabilitation. And um, I know Zimbabwe has written about the death of rehabilitation in this country, and the expectation is it's punishment. You have broken the laws of society, and as Vivian's talked about, the, the policies really are deterrence theory based. So it is punishment based. The idea is if you break this rule, we will, um, you know, increase the level of punishment. So that way everybody understands if you break this rule, you will have this level of punishment. So the emphasis has become more and more about punishment of those individuals. And nobody talks about rehabilitation. Um, you know, similarly, you know, to go back to the, the previous thing, the, the apathy or ignorance about, well, where is the rehabilitation? Can you rehabilitate someone when someone has to check a box then when they're looking for, for a job that can suddenly straight away negate them from having that job? What, what's the purpose of rehabilitation? Um, I think um, the, the other side um, as well to that is the idea that as Vivian said, um, you know, politicians can get votes when it comes to the idea of being tough on crime as opposed to being soft on crime. And tough means emphasizing uh, the concept of, of punishment. Um, so that's, I think that's the first thing. I, I also had something else in my mind, and I'm going to admit that I've just forgotten what it is. So I'm going to step back, and hopefully it'll come back into my mind. I will, also, I will also say that, you know, advocates of correctional policy, um, they're not advocating for people uh, not to have consequences uh, due to their crimes, right? We're not advocating for that. We're basically saying that people are going to be released and that if we think about a rehabilitative um, uh, philosophy that we then uh, treat people in that way. So like Germany, like actually the Department of Corrections, the chief from the DOC here in Pennsylvania has traveled uh, far uh, to, to Germany and, and other places to try to mirror what has happened or what is going on in those countries and try to bring it back. And, and many other states are trying to mirror that. Um, and, and, but it's very difficult. It's difficult because, you know, it, it, you have to deal with the institution, you deal with the state, you deal with, uh, you know, how are you going to get funding? Um, I mean, the, <clears throat> and we don't use this as much, but the truth and sentencing, um, law basically said that you can get federal funds for your prisons if you keep 80 if you keep your prison population 85% of their time right and we're and, and judges are now using more discretion and now it has been given back to them because it was actually stripped when we uh, implemented mandatory minimums and so when you have the entire system kind of thinking very you know um, deterrence, deterrence, and very rational choice. They committed the crime and they thought about it and so they need to go away for long periods of time. Um, then it's very difficult to make that change. What we know from the research as well is that short-term incarceration is actually more effective than long-term incarceration. So if you have like a year or maybe even six months, right now drug courts are using um, <clears throat> are using methods where they uh, you go into the drug court and if you test positive, they might put you in for a day, 24 hours. And that, you know, that, that, that consequence might be more effective than if you put that person for two weeks even. Because now what you're doing is you're taking the person away from their job, you're taking away the person away from their uh, employment, excuse me, their job, their employment, um, their families. Um, and so now you are stripping them away from these connections and these things that actually keep them um, as, a, as a member of society, right? That, that continues to put them um, um, as, a, you know, as a working member of society, right? The person that we want sitting next to us at the movie theater, right? Yeah, and I, so I just remembered what it was as well. You had a um, moment? I had a senior moment. Yeah, I, it's, it's happening quite quite a lot now actually. Um, so one of the things that um, as well that comes to mind is um, we don't think about you know when, with the punishment we concentrate on those people who are being incarcerated. Um, the other side of it is to think about the communities that these individuals are being taken from. Um, you know, as I say, the statistic um, that, Vi that Vivian brought up, just to re-emphasize that, um, 
currently speaking, we're talking about if you're an African American male, uh, as a high school dropout between 20 to 40 in terms of age, you have a 33% chance, a one in three chance of being incarcerated. Now, if you think about that for um, African American communities, you are taking individuals out of those communities and incarcerating them. Now, you can talk about the then loss of parent figures or adult figures from those communities, but you can also talk about the idea of you are taking individuals who potentially can earn money out of those communities and therefore actually increasing the likelihood of poverty or economic marginalization in those communities. Um, to put it simply, or statistically, uh, when I first came to this country, and here I am very aware of my British accent as I tell you everything that's wrong with America, <laughs> on, on camera. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so if I'm, if I'm not here for, for work, you, you know. Uh, um, but basically, if... Um, when I first came to this country, uh, the simple statistic is the richest 20% um, of American population controlled 83% of the total wealth of this country. That's when I first came to this country in the first few years of the 21st century. So about 83% of the total wealth controlled by the richest 20% of this country. Right now, um, it is the richest 20% controlling 90% of the total wealth of this country. Um, so during that time period that I've lived here, and it's not my fault, but during that time that I've lived here, the, that richest 20% has increased 7% of their total wealth. That means there has been a huge increase in poverty in the bottom social classes. 15% um, of the American population live below the poverty line right now. Um, now, if there's a direct link between poverty and crime, then by increasing the levels of poverty, by taking people out of communities and putting them into prison, you're actually causing the po very problem as to why people are being incarcerated uh, with these policies. Um, and the strange thing is, it costs, I, I'm sure it's, it's increased now, but um, roughly about $25,000 a year to keep someone incarcerated. A little uh, more than that it's if you're mentally ill. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically we're talking, what, 50 to $60 billion a year to keep everybody in prison? Um, and the weird thing is, if again, slightly controversial here, um, you know, if you took 50 to $60 billion and possibly injected it into public education, then possibly you wouldn't have so many people being high school dropouts and possibly have, having to suffer from poverty, which leads to crime in the first place. It's a wild idea. It's a wild idea. It's crazy. I know it's late at night and I've, I've, got, I've got a silly accent, so I'll, I'll move away from the microphone. Well, no, we, what we know is that in, in the 1990s, I'll give you an example, California used to use about 80% um, of their budget on education, that, you know, public universities, uh, schooling, um, and that 80% began to shift, right? And so now they use, and currently, I don't know the, the statistic, but it shifted from being 80% uh, in education to about 70 or so percent for law enforcement. And that is, that it's jails, prisons, um, and, and everything um, of that nature. And so I think that that's a really interesting point that you make, is like, who, who are the people that are sort of uh, suffering this dehumanization, right? Like, we are talking about the criminalization of poverty, because we know that uh, what we see is sort of the intersection of race and class uh, when we look at the population of people that are in prison. And so when you go out, if you live in more urban communities, you see that the policing is differently, right? You see more patrol cars uh, out. And so and so they are policing a sort of open market. Uh, and I did a little bit uh of work on this where you are basically policing, you know, if you go to an urban community, you might see someone on the corner selling, right? And so you're policing that in a very different way than if you went to a more suburban area. And I used to go to school uh, and teach at a more suburban area. And so you don't see as many policing out, right, and as many police cars, because the market, uh, particularly the drug market, moves indoors when you're talking about higher socioeconomic status, right? And I used to go to a university where you used to knock three times on a particular door, and they used to slip you, not that I know. Uh, 
Did I say that on camera? Um, but they used to provide, it was, it was known to everybody that that was the house, and it was a well-known you know, house where um, college students live in that house, right? Um, and so that market is going to be completely, policed completely differently um, than you would see, you know, um, downtown in DC, uh, which is the area where I went to school. Um, so that also, I think, takes into account in terms of, uh, to your point and your question, why is it that we are not doing anything about how we are treating our prisoners? It perhaps could be because we're treating uh, people that we see as criminals, and we're probably treating people that um, we don't have a lot of empathy for because, again, going into social psychology, we have been uh, tuned to think that certain people are more likely to commit crimes, right? Does anybody else have um, any questions? Please feel free to do so. If not, okay, well, thank you very much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed the movie and the talk. Thank you.